Um, so APAL is a volunteer run arts collective um, with collaborative teams that work through different departments. We have a zine library, um, archive team, a publishing team, a TV channel, a radio station, a merch team, and this book club specifically, and the work we've been doing with I'm a Fuss has been going on through our zine library. Um, and this is the second collaboration that we've done together. Um, and I'm going to pull up the first project to give you kind of a sense of the work we're interested in doing. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Can you see? Okay, so this is our pandemic museum worksheet. Um, we released it the first week of September to be filled in by people who are choosing to attend museums as they reopen or perhaps are currently front of house staff in museums. Um, it was really meant to reveal inequities within museums, both during the COVID-19 moment and also outside of it. Um, and we're hoping to turn the information collected into a like data-based zine. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing. And I think, Kat, were you gonna introduce I'm a Puss? Yeah. <laughs> So IMFS is, stands for Institute of Museums Against All Fucked Up Social Systems. Um, it was founded by Maggie this summer. And essentially what we're trying to do is challenge the notions of what museums are and what their purposes are. And we're a re research lab and also think tank of a group of people with all different backgrounds. Um, we're working on a few different projects right now. And we're very much process driven. So we're very much interested not in like the final product of what we're going for, but how it, what the steps are and what it takes to just kind of envision like our goals and our mission. And we're always changing. So we're always currently like adding things to our principle, guiding principles and also people as a part of our research lab. Um, a few of the things that we're currently working on this is one, um, was the worksheet with eight ball and also this reading group. We also have um, a collaboration with Greenpoint Writers Group. Uh, we also have a, a museum production committee that we're working a, a couple projects on there. And we also have a monthly newsletter. So if you guys, I'm not sure how you guys found out if it was that through eight ball or us, but um, if you are interested in IMFS, please check out our website and you can also sign up for our newsletter. Thanks, Kat. Um, I'm going to be the timekeeper, so I'll try to move things along. We're doing great on time so far. <laughs> and I'm going to just quickly talk about why we are having this anti-museum book club. There has been a lot of anti-museum sentiments, uh, as we see a lot on social media, a lot stemming from how museums have you know, traditionally not have had very diverse exhibitions or collections. And there a lot of museums across the US are open, but they're not paying front of house staff with hazard pay, which is very problematic. Um, so we were thinking about uh, readings and resources that already exist and have existed for a while that sort of um, discuss and bring up these anti-museum uh, sentiments and why that might be valid. And we don't really, it's not that we encourage anti-museum sentiments, but we definitely want to try to see like if what is valid about that and should we be anti-museum or should we actually be pro-museum still? Is there still hope for museums um, to sort of actually be against the problematic social systems? Uh, and we selected four sets of readings. There are five readings total, but we paired two of them. The first one that we're going to discuss today is why we are, uh, no, museums, white supremacy and diversity, which Kat will moderate. Uh, and the second one is against the supremacy of thought, which Alberto will moderate. 
and um, how do museums hold up white supremacy and black art and historical omission, um, which will be moderated by Blakey and Kat. And then lastly, are art museums racist, uh, which will be moderated by Blakey and me. And then we'll have some time at the end to sort of synthesize the relevance of the four uh, readings together. Uh, and any sort of additional commentary or questions from you all. And thank you for joining on a Sunday afternoon. I'm super excited. Uh, so should I just hand it off to you, Kat, for museums, white supremacy, and diversity? Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so this was uh, the reading that I ended up picking for the first book club. Um, it's Museums, White Privilege and Diversity, A Systemic Perspective by Gretchen Jennings and Joanne Jones Rizzi. Uh, I'm not sure if all of you have read it, um, and if you did, great. Uh, so basically just to give a quick summary of some of the main points from the reading. Um, so it's an opinion piece by both of the writers. Uh, that was, a, I believe, published by the Association of Science and Technology Committees. Um, and it has to do a lot with museum viewership and just the diversity of people who are actually going to museums. So the information is based off of the 2010 Bureau Census and what's happening in that is that it has like the breakdown of just museum viewership, which is about apparently 10% is minorities that are actually going to museums, um, which is not representative of the 2010 Bureau Census of 34% minorities in the US. Uh, and they just kind of go into like why, how museums are, can actually do programming to actually encourage more diverse audiences to come. The most successful museums that have been able to do this were children's museums and science museums, but fine art museums and his, like histo history museums were, had a very like less diverse audience. Um, and part of the, what they go into is also what are the three conditions that can actually hopefully support a more diverse um, audience? And one of them, and they all have to do with what the museums can do. Uh, one of the first things that the museum that they look at is that a museums should be looking at how they should change and not how they need to change the audience per se. So what are the things that they can do to actually encourage this? So what kind of programming can they do? Are they doing exhibitions that encourage the audience, the communities around them to come. And then another thing that they also look at is museums, because of their leadership, isn't actually representative of the current um, minority representation in the US. So how can museums also do this? Like how can they, they, there's ways that they can do diverse hires, but the problem is, are they listening to the voices of the people of color that are in their staff? Um, but most of the leadership, especially the executive seniors, are lacking a lot of diversity. Um, one of the statistics there is that about zero to twenty percent of the senior leadership roles have been filled by minorities. So that's way less than our current statistic of about thirty-eight percent minorities in the U.S. Um, and then they also look at how museums are not also in relation to the leadership. Um, how they can't really embody the vision of actual diversity um, and inclusion. So there's a lot of othering with exhibitions and museums have often been seen as neutral spaces, which is problematic because it just continues to uphold the systemic oppression that most museums have been embodying. Um, so it, the article has some suggestions and just some different viewpoints of how to actually address these issues, um, but to see the changes actually being implemented, we have yet to. And for anyone who has read this article, um, so if anyone wants to speak now also too, they can unmute themselves and add anything that they also thought was important about this article. Um, and if anyone has any thoughts in general, feel free to speak up. <laughs> Um, here. I had a, I had a question. 
Uh, yeah. If we want to start. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if we could talk about the term neutral space that you just brought up. Yeah. It feels like it's a word that's kind of used within museum contexts a lot of the time to exclude perspectives beyond like those upholded by the primarily white leadership. Um, and when museums try and remain like floating above political discourse and social issues favoring this kind of like neutrality, it's rejecting the potential to be like to become a socially engaged space. Mm -hmm. But I was also kind of thinking about the reverse, like when museums like attempt to engage in social issues just to save face in a way. Like we keep seeing this with um, larger institutions engagement with Black Lives Matter protests. Feels like there's now like a social pressure for museums to like do the bare minimum to seem like they care just enough, which almost feels like a form of neutral space itself. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, Yeah, it's hard because uh, that's true. It's like, it's, it has to do with like, again, like the article, like are they actually integrating the voices of the people that they want to have attend their museums just for the sake of that, uh, the record shows that they tried, but yeah. Yeah, I think also the, the, the question of why do so some museums want to expand because but it's just money that they're after and so how does because we can see that if they're not making the changes within their like high-ranking um, employees then it's not really a serious like like push for a, a change in the way that this that the institution actually is run so i know i'm sure that like all of us probably have had have been like diversity interns at some point or something like that. And so there's those jobs, but they never, but they're not meant to become like directors. They're not meant to become in charge. It's more like we get to say that we did this thing, but not give this person any institutional power. And I think that in audience engagement, we see that a lot. It's not really about wanting the audience, it's just about wanting the numbers. And it's kind of, um, I didn't read this whole article, but I think it's touched on a little bit in when they talked about like, what are we even saying when we say community? Like, what does that mean? Who are we, whose community, what, like, what is, what is the, that a code word for? Yeah. Yeah, that was a, I thought that was a really interesting point. It's, it was very um, othering in the piece, basically. Like it's saying that community is specific to the underprivileged, um, low income communities that maybe surround the museum, but there isn't a connection between the museum and the communities that they maybe live nearby or like, so that's another problem to be addressed of like how to unify. <laughs> actually unify this properly. Um, there was a, that was an interesting thing I thought in the reading. Um, so in the reading, they have a few definitions, um, such as like oppression, white supremacy, and like um, white privilege was one of the things that was, a, that was specified in it. Um, and for me personally, I never actually thought of white supremacy in the way that the, they wrote it, but for other people, did they see it similarly or did they also um, already think about that or have a completely different notion of what white privilege meant to them? Wait, Kat, could you, could I ask you to rephrase the question? Yeah. Sorry. I yeah, absolutely. Wait. So there's a, there's a specific, a specific definition of like white privilege in the article. Um, and if people have, can pull it up or see it, is it, uh, the way that the authors write about white, uh, 
privilege? Do they already feel that that was something that they viewed it in the same way, or do they have a different definition before reading um, what the authors wrote? Um, on page 65, um, I really like that the definition of white privilege there points to the fact that privilege has less to do with wealth or prosperity, because I think when we say the word privilege and we, and we just sort of like put an image to it, we think of just like money and like property and things. Um, but they point to privilege as being able to accept way the way of looking at the world that pervades U.S. society. Like they don't, they don't, they don't ever really feel inspired to like challenge the way we go about things, the current standards, the current policies, the current rules, because it actually serves them, and there, there's just like no reason to. And this sort of I think this definition really points to why so much institutional racism is like silent as opposed to explicit, which they also discuss. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, does anyone else have any thoughts on that definition or anything that they even want to add to that? Okay. Um, let's see. So there are the three conditions in the article um, that maybe breaking them down more would be also nicer. So the first one is looking at the change within the museum as opposed to changing others, which doesn't just apply to museums, it applies to other systems and just also people in general. I personally, I really liked the way it was viewed. Like, again, like it has to do with the museums and what are their mission statements, what are their visions, what what is their intended goals for how they serve as like in the again like in the community and wherever spaces they're holding. What is the purpose of a museum? And without that internal change and internal awareness, how can they actually serve those purposes at all? Right. Um, does anyone actually know, think, can think of a museum that maybe already does this? I don't think I can pinpoint an exact museum, but I know mm -hmm. that all museums kind of advocate this, like we are changing, we are listening, we are doing the work type of mentality and type of language. Um, but it, it's like this this weird thing of like, can a museum, or I'm proposing, I guess I'm proposing another question is like, can a museum actually be reformed by doing such things? Because they're inherently structures of oppression. So I don't think, I think the museum can actively try to do its best, but inherently, it, I don't believe in its reforming anymore. <laughs> and that's just a personal opinion. Yeah, I guess, what do you think would be the the best alternative or solution to that then? I think one of the multiple solutions or, or options that people have laid forward is just building like our own spaces, authentic spaces, um, which is still like difficult to envision that under our current structure and our system. Because if we open our own space, does that mean we still have to operate under the means of capitalism? Um, so ultimately, are we any different than the original space we're trying to separate ourselves from? So that's something to take into consideration. I totally agree with you, Alberto. And I love the idea that they talk about on page 64, like at the beginning of the article of the compassionate and empathetic museum. Um, 
and like having these be the grounding basis of like what a museum is like a new museum is but obviously never having seen this in practice like is there a way to construct that empathetic museum within like I'm, I guess I'm kind of just rephrasing your question but it feels like such a big question like is there a way to construct that out of the current institution or like what does it look like what is our muse our ideal museum look like like we know the leadership will be people of color what does the space look like like does this require doing away completely with the institution instead creating collective spaces that are art centric but aren't necessarily called museums even mm -hmm. yeah yeah i guess uh, if anyone also has that thought like what does their ideal museum look like uh I'm trying to think of like an example of the closest to ideal I've ever even seen myself, which again, like falls in line with the article probably with mostly children's spaces um, where I feel like those have been, again, like have the most diverse audiences usually and successfully has more interaction. Yeah. Another part of that also, I guess it's, yeah, it's interesting because if that, the ideal doesn't exist, the article is kind of address, like, addressing this issue in a way that we can realistically, hopefully, tackle the issue. Um, one of the interesting things that I thought was, uh, that the article mentions is that there's a very specific website that museums actually use for diverse hires. It's called museumhue.com. I know, has anyone heard of it? I've never heard of it before personally, but it's a specific organization to connect museums to diverse hires. Um, and if you look at their website, they actually have, I think like maybe around a hundred museums have used it to help with their own staffing. But Jasmine was even mentioning that like ha just having those people there doesn't actually lead to leadership or systemic change, right? So, uh, I I wanted to say, can you guys hear me? Uh, yeah. Uh, I wanted to see if uh, speaking of like the idea of diverse hires and stuff like that, did you guys hear about uh, Ebony L. Haynes getting kind of like that all black David Zwinger Gallery in Chelsea? I uh, I did uh, yes. Oh my yeah. god. That Please talk more about that. That like blew, really yeah, blew my so, mind. Yeah, so Ebony Elhaven, she's a curator who, I think she was originally supposed to get like a position or something like that, but then in the wake of all of this, uh, you know, everything that's going on, they ended up just giving her a full gallery and it's going to be uh, completely black staff. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of an example of somebody from like this, I guess the directorial position all the way down, having that kind of diverse hire. But it does make me wonder, Kind of what we were talking about before about like just that are we still just going to do the same kind of exploitive things except with black people like is it going to be different or i don't know what you guys think about that because obviously we don't know but it's just something to bring up yeah no that's great it, it is hard to imagine right now because um there's like a whole slew of news just about um like indigenous curators or like new black curators or um at museums and art spaces that but that's if i feel like a lot of that's been new right like that's um, this news has been coming out in this past year so it's hard to tell what what will all this change actually look like um, um we have five minutes left for this reading okay. uh and i also like that i was so shocked when i got that newsletter about swerner's new gallery and I thought about how Zorner sort of, David Zorner, like being the most powerful gallery in the world by many standards, like they have the money and the resources to do these really huge initiatives that seems to be following the political climate. So I've always sort of like respected that they put their money where their mouth is, but also like they are this super hyper commercial, successful money-making machine so the, like there's this like cognitive dissonance that I experience whenever they do these like super on point initiatives. 
as a business. Yeah. I almost want a business tactic. Yeah, I think it's I also see like Zorner's power in the market and I'm excited for what the programming might look like in regards to taking in more artists of color or black artists. But again, that doesn't really like lead to liberation. It's still within the same capitalist structure. It's still exciting because it means uh, black people will get paid honorably, I hope. <laughs> um, but at the same time, like we're still operating under all of the shit. So it's like there's no true fundamental fucking change. I'm sorry that I'm cussing. I just got a little frustrated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think it would be a different story if David Werner was like, I gave a bunch of million dollars to this group who is doing their own thing. But like at the end of the day, this is a David Werner gallery. So like it's still about his pockets and his his project is under his name, it's his umbrella of stuff. But yeah, like I mean I like seeing uh like black art people make money, but I've also been in situations where like black art museum people are very comfortable con like continuing with like a lot of anti-black capitalist structures so it's more like a, i guess we'll see kind of situation for this particular gallery mm -hmm. um yeah uh, i've also want to there's a couple comments in the chat from a couple of people um i don't know if you want one of the questions is about board directors and their roles in museums um, so I guess the question is, would getting rid of these boards or drastically change them or do anything to the museums? Um, what was interesting actually in the articles is in terms of the statistics, I think board members are amongst the most diverse group within some of the museum structures. But if anyone has any thoughts on that, I personally feel like I'm less familiar with the way board directors play a role in museums, but does anyone think that it would make a change? And I know um, only a little bit about boards because that's like their whole thing is all their meetings are private and they're it's very, very secretive. But a lot of what happens is like at the end of the day, it's like a board member is a Trump supporter, so we can't be an anti-Trump institution. So it, it's like they still hold this inordinate amount of control over what happens in the museum. And a lot of times it's like, yeah, like they're purposely secretive in a way that that like the curatorial side does not, uh, doesn't get to be. And so it, it's, um, I don't know, I don't like, I don't really know why we have boards. So I don't know what it would look like to not have them, but it's like. You know, it, it, yeah, because these boards, like you're saying, they're so secretive and they also hold a lot of decision-making power, I think, but how would that, would that be able to, are we really able to change them because they hold such a like, I feel like such a static place and where they are in the art world. Um, and someone also mentioned Oakland Museum of Art, um, which would be cool to discuss. I don't know anything. I've never been there, but cool if that's a great example of what an art museum should look like. Okay, we're at time for this reading. Alberto or Kat, any final thoughts before we move on to the next reading? No, um, just thanks for everyone for participating. Hi, so I'll continue with the second reading. The second reading in today's discussion is, oh, and also I just FYI, I'm gonna be reading from a little, from my notes just to keep my thoughts um, organized because I can tend to 
go into tangents and <laughs> not address things properly. So I'm going to follow the structure that I have written for me. So I'm sorry and I apologize if I sound robotic. The second reading in today's discussion, discussion is titled Against the Supremacy of Thought by artist and writer Manuel Arturo Abiru. This essay was published in Rhizome in 2018. So before I begin my short summary of the reading, I want to acknowledge that this reading may have not been accessible in regards to processing the content and the overall thesis. I'm still struggling with some of the material addressed, but I hope we can unpack some of our concerns and questions through discussion. So against the supremacy of thought is structured into 11 points, which go as followed. Reanalyzing the thought fetish, the contemporary, the end of art, the conceptualist gamut, an oak tree 1973, Cartesian dualism and anti-Black animalization, the violence of modernism, LaRoche's post-art, hashtag hey Black time, Wiki Africa, and the last point, Black reclamation of criticality. All 11 points connect to the overall thesis of addressing white supremacy in our modes of thought consciousness, hence the title of the essay Against the Supremacy of Thought. The author connects how religion, language, and appearance were tools of early domination against black and brown people and result its justification for white conquest, genocide, and slavery. It associates how modernism itself was premised on colonial imperial theft as white artists have stolen from black and brown aesthetics and contemporary art is no different. In the section titled The Violence of Modernism, the author amplifies how the animalization or the otherness of black and brown people as lacking reason, rendered the theft of their native lands, aesthetics, and bodies as raw material. Their stolen objects served inspiration for modernism. For example, he quotes Picasso. African sculptures had helped me to understand, or has helped him understand the purpose as a painter, which was not to entertain decorative images, but to mediate between perceived reality and the creativity of the human mind. Picasso uses Picasso use, use of the African sculpture is a concrete example of black and brown life inspiring white art. The supremacy of thought upholds this erasure of white debt. The author acknowledges that the art history owes black people reparations and black artists today if chosen to do so can operate under the assumption that art owes them. Black artists do not need to make things or think or write or create value in a way for art's inherently racist and capitalist structure of oppression. An example of a black artist working outside the models of arts patrimony is Rafia, Rafia Santana and her project play and her project hashtag pay black time. The artist describes the project as a white money transference system that provides free meals via seamless slash grub hub to black and brown folks across North America. This is a project that offers white people an easy way to make concrete change and brings the audience into the conversation of what America owes black people. The author concludes by stating, to stand against the supremacy of Western thought begins to delay the ground for the reclamation of critical aesthetics against European reasons, history of black dehumanization. Overall, calling for a reclaiming of black and brown aesthetics, which have been stolen because of colonization and imperialism, but as well as a reclaiming of critique and blackness. And in conclusion, I want to say that the summary is, I laid out the summary in the most basic way because it's, very, it's a very complex reading. So I encourage everyone to spend some time with it if you haven't already. Um, I also would like to open this up for discussion. So if anyone else would like to address some points I did not mention. can move on to the next question. I know it's a lot, so hopefully you get to spend some time with the essay. Like I said, it was, well, in my opinion, it took me some time and I'm still reading through it and processing a lot. I, but I ask a second question to everyone here today. So drawing on Picasso's work as an example of how black sculpture influenced his work, can we name other white artists who have appropriated black and brown aesthetics?
I have two other examples that I thought of when I saw the example of Picasso. I thought about Joseph Albers. Um, and I only thought about him because I had to do like some research for this internship that I had. I was looking at his early writings and he was sending letters to his friends back at home in Germany because um, he was living in Mexico at the time. And in his letters, he was writing how he's never seen or experienced color before. And Mexico and all his friends should come to Mexico to produce work. <laughs> so I think that's another example of how modernism um, or white artists are stealing from black and brown aesthetics. And then another individual that I pinpointed was Pa Goen. Wait, Goen? You can never say his name right. But just his um, like depiction of Polynesian women, but also his celebration of use of color was also not revolutionary, but revolutionary in the sense of a, a white perspective, which is also the supplement of, of just like this Western perspective of like, taking from black and brown people. <laughs> I don't know, I've, I've, with those two examples I just laid out, I don't know if anyone else has another example of white artists taking or appropriating or in, being inspired by. I, uh, the, the most recent one I can think of is probably, I forgot her name, but the Emmett Till painting that was in the mm -hmm. written by now. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. an example of what well intentioned, but it's like, I don't know, it's still really, a lot of people do not enjoy it. I think that's a really great example, especially when it comes to the topic of like black pain and a white woman appropriating that. And I know there's like larger conversations about the topic, but I think that's a really good one. Anyone else have other um, examples they can think of? They can even be contemporary artists, like the one just mentioned, or modernist artists. I was thinking of uh, Matisse and his stealing of African fabrics and also masks like Picasso. Definitely. Yeah, part of this article that, like, I found, maybe it's because I reread it the most, um, <laughs> like, and, and I was trying to grasp it, um, but where the author talks about um, the idea of the artifact versus the art object, which comes up in some of the other readings, too, um, but how because a lot of... Uh, I mean, here they're talking about African art objects that were stolen being then made into ethnographic artifacts and not deemed art. So it almost was as if for Picasso and, and Matisse and Gauguin, it's like you're not, it's not plagiarism, it's not stealing because it's not art almost, which was such a terrifying way of thinking about that. Um, and it's just like so horrific, but really interesting the way that they were outlining it yeah that's exactly i think the pinpoint of the article just having that supremacy of thought over not viewing these objects as art but as decorative or not important or like as other museums have said it like primitive and i have like one last question was there anything you disagree with if you did read the article? In my opinion, if I want to answer the question, I don't have anything I disagreed with. <laughs> I supported the stance 100%. And I have to continue reading this essay just because there's a lot more that I didn't fully get to process. Um, so I, I did explain earlier that my summary 
was in the most basic sense. And I know that my summary was still a little complex <laughs> in a way. So I definitely encourage everyone who hasn't, who have, have not read the essay to do so. Um, and maybe we can revisit it in a future um, book club meeting. Um, I'm not sure if we wanted to continue to move along or if we wanted to use up all our, our time frame. Um, this, this reading was definitely like super hard for me. <laughs> so I wonder like, um, if there's any part that people were confused by that they feel compelled to get any clarification on or like discuss so that we can understand it. I did have a problem in the section where they mention post art. I, th I think I have a grasp of it, but I'm not confident enough to articulate what I think that idea is, um, even though they make an extremely strong argument throughout the essay. But post art is, when it is a section in, in this essay that I had some trouble digesting in regards to context. I found this particular phrase really interesting. Um, it's like point four towards the end, the reduction of art to commentary on the world affairs and meta comments on its own history. I just thought that framing art as commentary on the world, on the world affairs as a sort of reduction in its like higher, in hierarchy of things was really interesting because I think I, I've seen, I guess maybe it's sort of to answer your question about what I disagree with. I don't know if I disagree with it, but I've definitely seen a lot of social justice oriented art being produced as commodity or like existing social justice oriented art being commodified because people know that there's a lot of attention on it. And I think in the past, decade or so, social justice oriented art has been elevated in its status, at least by major institutions. But I guess there's like a school of thought or there's like a group of scholars or thinkers who think of social justice oriented art as something that reduces the position of art because they pro like in traditional art history, art should be for the sake of art only which is again, the supremacy of thought. I'm like blowing my own mind right now. Yeah, is, am I interpreting this the same way y'all interpreted the reduction of art? Well, I, I interpreted it the same way, so I totally agree. Um, also, we have five minutes left on this reading. So if y'all have any comments, questions. Oh, well, another thing that I thought was super interesting was that this originates on the platform called Rhizome, which is now affiliated with the new museum. Mm -hmm. Well, not now, but since like, I wanna say maybe three, maybe even five years ago, and the new museum, the past year has definitely had the light shed on itself as a problematic institution. <laughs> yeah. I think they're still continuing their union struggle. So solidarity to all the 
union workers out at the museum. But I'm not sure how, I know that Rhizome is connected to the new museum, um, but I don't know if it's just housed in the new museum or I don't exactly know how they're affiliated. I know they're connected, but I don't know how, if, they, if they're part of the programming, if they're contributing to essays or um, museum publications and things like that. I'm unfamiliar with. I know that Rhizome originated separately and independently, and then the affiliation came later. My best guess is that the new museum provides some sort of an infrastructure for Rhizome to continue operating. Mm -hmm. I want to thank everyone who took part in today's short discussion we just had. Um, I guess I have a question if I haven't looked this up separately myself about Wiki Africa um, from that section I just thought it was because I've never seen the Wikipedia page for Africa I just I was like, surprised about the lack of information or accuracy that it had and the disrespect it was to like the entire continent of Africa so I don't know do you have some familiarity with the project at all uh, or just more to unpack from that section? Um, not too familiar with the project other than what I've consumed from the reading, but just viewing um, the information provided, how Wikilinks does, not Wikilinks, sorry, <laughs> Wikipedia, I'm sorry, not Wikilinks, Wikipedia um, views itself as like a democratic platform, but that democracy doesn't apply to the information that's being provided in regards to the continent of Africa. So that was a very interesting um, concept that I read through the through the essay. Yeah. Um, uh, we have two minutes left, so we can move on to the next meeting. I mean, next reading, um, unless. Somebody, did somebody want to speak? I feel like I heard like someone else. Oh, Victoria, yes. Hi, um, so I, I just received the, the link 30 minutes ago. So um, I didn't do the readings, but um, I'm happy to just uh, listen and chime in if uh, I feel like I have something to say. I'm calling from uh, Montreal, by the way. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Victoria. Yeah. Welcome. Um, okay, maybe we'll move on to the next reading and I'm going to just put the link in the chat just in case anybody needs it. Um, and we're going to, Kat and I are going to talk about two, um, two readings kind of at the same time. The Instagram post by Anissa Tavangar and, um, so, and the chapter from Anti Catalog. Um, which is pages 42 to 47, if you're scrolling through that massive document. I'm just gonna write that in, 42, 47. Um, so I'm gonna just give a little background. Um, if you haven't read the piece, Black Art and Historical Omission from Anti-Catalog, um, and also just ground it in its own history a bit. So this chapter came from a book published in 1977 called an anti-catalog um, and the project was the work of a group called AMCC or Artists Meeting for Cultural Change um, and its purpose was to protest the Whitney's 1976 exhibition titled Three Centuries of American Art and the show featured John D. Rockefeller III's collection of 18th and 19th century art. Um, in his collection there was only one work from a Black artist and one female artist. The chapter returns to this like idea of separation of black artists within museums that comes up throughout a lot of these readings. Um, and the chapter continues to discuss omission and it's like powerful and horrific role to suppress black artists um, from the exclusion from the making of fine arts, um, which the chapter 
defines fine arts as art of the oppressor or the art that makes it into the museum um, and the exclusion of entire groups of people from art viewing um, determine like the limited social conditions that existed in many of which still persist in contemporary museum contexts. Um, should we summarize the Instagram posts now too? Or yeah, maybe we'll just talk about it. Um, I don't know if you want to, if you all have it pulled up, but um, it's called How Do Museums Uphold White Supremacy? Um, and it basically outlines the history of the Rockefeller Wing at the Met, which houses art from um, what they describe as, what is it? The regions of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was donated by Nelson Rockefeller, who founded the Museum of Primitive Art and is the also the brother of John D. Rockefeller III, who donated the work for the Whitney's Three Centuries of American Art exhibition. So there's some familial ties here, which is very easy to tell with their <laughs> racist concerns they have. Um, so we could, we have a few discussion questions, um, but first maybe we can open up the conversation to any initial observations and thoughts you all might have. Or we can also ask some questions. Yeah, actually, to get going. <laughs> um, has anyone ever visited the the Rockefeller Wing at the Met? Um, yeah, and if so, could you describe it? Your experience? I don't think I can like paint a picture, but my time in that Rockefeller Wing feels kind of almost separate from the rest of the museum in a way just the way the artifacts are displayed. It's like overall mood and lighting, lack of information, which kind of the post does address. So it's like, I totally think that post is validating to my overall experience during the, in the Rockefeller Wing. Yeah. It was hard to get to also, like when you were... And, that, and that's the thing, it's just like, oh, it wasn't, not necessarily it wasn't hard, I just like stumbled upon it when I was just walking through the map. So it wasn't like I was trying to look for it, it just was part of me navigating through the museum. I feel like the Rockefeller Wing too, like as you're moving through the museum, you pass through it to get to other places. Like it feels like a through way for other galleries, um, for sure. I was act, I was just about to actually say that it does feel kind of like just a transition from like one gallery to the next. I, the, every time I'm there, it's definitely just like a oh oh yeah, this is also this is also here. It's also really dark too. I feel like most of it's really dark, um, whereas there's like bright lighting throughout the rest of the museum. It has this very like dimly lit, almost dingy feeling, um, which makes it like a kind of strange art viewing experience. Like the pieces are, I feel like they're almost like underlit. There's something very moody about it. And it's, it's just very separated from the viewing experience of other galleries in the Met. Hmm. Oh, there's a comment in the chat. The labels in the Rockefeller Wing are deeply lacking in cultural context. They provide info on the country, culture, and object, but no other information. Yeah, that's um, what Anissa discusses too. Like there's, it's just like, it's kind of just like a disrespect to the artifacts and the culture and like the art that's there. Um, which is a shame. Um, if you guys are interested, apparently her thesis is online, so it addresses this even more. Um, it connects to the NC catalog too, just of the way, um, I don't know how many people read it, but like Blake was mentioning how a lot of the artists and craftsmen, about 85%, right, uh, during the 19th century were African-Americans, but that was the only way they were accredited like any sense of like creative like creative freedom but we're still also just not acknowledged and unheard does the essay cover 
like repatriation of these artifacts? Um, not really. I think An Anissa mentions repatriation in her um, in her post, and I'm sure in her thesis too. But it doesn't quite get there. And I think also like acknowledging that it was written in 1977 too mm -hmm. is important when thinking about that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I was I was thinking about that as I read this. Um, and also like the, the idea of like the unwritten art history that they talk about in the anti-catalog and what has been erased and rescinded from cultural ethos as like as a practice of white supremacy and kind of thinking about what are some of the ways that we can like both rewrite our own historical education to include like black indigenous and people of color artists um, and how we can reframe the art within uh, the Rockefeller wing until it's reframed in a better context and completely changed um, or given to the countries it was stolen from. And I don't know, just thinking through like, if we could talk about like some of the tools that we can use as learning people to like rewrite that history for ourselves. Um, an example of that kind of reframing the, the museum that I was, I guess you to was on the loop in Abu Dhabi actually, where over there, instead of putting galleries together by like, uh, Africa or like, you know, just continents and uh, geographical locations, they kind of created a storyline that you kind of follow throughout uh, history, putting a lot of different cultures next to each other and like comparing and contrasting them in the same gallery. So it's put kind of like the same emphasis on the entire world and like taking it through kind of like a, a time thing rather than like, a, oh, this is from Africa or this is from wherever. Because I think it's just more interesting that way because you can actually compare what you're trying to compare, you're trying to tell a story. Yeah, that's super interesting. It's at the, you said Abu Dhabi? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I feel like, you know, in thinking of ways we could restructure, I mean, the Rockefeller wing in this example, like creating a narrative that allows for cultural context to, cultural context and, and history of like art practices to actually be discussed is like so necessary. I'd also, I don't, I'd like to see like a, like a way to go through collections like the Rockefeller collection that focuses on the type of people who would take these artists, these objects, these art objects, and and display them this way over the years. So like like a, an ownership of of like the history of museums, like a kind of like I'm mining the museum, but coming from the museum itself, like a, a just admission of this is where we came from and not keeping it so fuzzy. Like, cause I can like, I doubt that they'll ever, you know, like even if they were to change the name of the Rockefeller collection, like all of these problems would still exist. So it's, so something that's just like, yeah, this is where we got get our money from these kind of people. And this is what they've done. And also the fact that the Rockefeller like wing and the Rockefeller collection itself like came from first a museum called the Museum of Primitive Art and nowhere in the Met, well actually I think Anissa says in, in one of the slides, um, I, they mention it on like one plaque, but like there's no discussion, there's no critical engagement with that history. It's just like, yeah, like it happened maybe. <laughs> like there's there's no ownership of that, which, has to happen for any kind of change to shift in that space like what would that I'm wondering now like what would that look like like is it like a huge is it a telling of the history like are we seeing that like as right as we enter the space like I think there needs to be as you're saying Jasmine like how can they own that like in the viewing experience 
Yeah. Yeah. In the like in the last slide, that's where she kind of she's like, "What's the solution to this?" Um, very immediately, she's like, "I don't know." Um, but the last sentence is, "Take everything out of the building and rearrange it all with new categories and priorities." <laughs> Um, I don't know if anyone has like another solution or idea of like how this can be done. Or even like, what are those priorities? Yeah. <laughs> I, I do believe in that solution as a way of approaching it. But I wonder yeah. how much context will get lost if the position of like curators or white curators are doing the work um so it's like is does it does is like is the meeting still going to be somewhat lost even if that curator quote unquote is an expert on african art but they're white i think that's another interesting topic and i know the brooklyn museum dealt with that conversation not too long ago when they hired a white um curator who was quote unquote like an expert on african art um I don't, I just opened that for, I don't, I just really opened that up for another question, but, <laughs> but yeah, I just, I just think about like, who's doing the work and are they doing it appropriately and authentically and like what, like whatever that looks like, you know? Mm -hmm. I, um, I'm also interested by this uh, solution, although like me myself, like if I say like if I were given the task to have to rearrange um, with new categories, I don't like I, I don't immediately see like how it would be done or what would be the correct way to do it and which categories to choose. But um, I guess like a, a, another solution in my view or something that is uh, aligned with that, but um, takes a different approach is maybe like um, being a, a bit more transparent and, and um, self-questioning as a museum. Um, and then like allowing the uh, visitors to sort of position themselves and interrogate their relationship with the art they see and to think about like, the institutions that like sort of put all of this and presented it the way it is. So like, uh, I think if it was like more individualized or, or like open for audiences to sort of like interpret and take different things in, that would be interesting. Uh, but I don't necessarily know how, although like I know the more um, technology and like participation is, um, involved in museums and like there are things where you can take your phone and um, get some extra like context or information about a piece of art. And I think that might be interesting to think about. This is like the point in the discussion where I'm like eager to say I'm like definitely anti-museums because even just trying to devise a plan or a solution for the situation within the current framework of museums where like this, this thing is called the Rockefeller Wing. And like actually in the worksheet that Blakey was showing um, earlier in the meeting, one of the questions we ask is, um, do you see a name that shows like who funded the gallery or this uh, exhibition space? There's like 95% of the time there's a name. There's somebody who funded that gallery, somebody who has a lot of say in what is shown in the gallery and how and what information is included in the gallery. So when there's a person who funded it and has so much um, narrative control over a space, how do we really come up with solutions that you know, are ethical? When, when ethics seem to be opposed to the interests of the people who are funding the space, like how can we work within museums? So this is a point where I, a lot of anti-museum sentiments are entering my my mind. Yeah, to kind of like I guess add on to that, it, it's the same thing that I've, I've been saying. You know, every time you go to the any museum at the moment or whatever, even 
a little hallway between us and the bathroom and some other closet will have some going on. Like individual people are funding like every single inch of the museum. So it is like a question of like, why would they be transparent? You know, why would they tell people how they get to be, how they apply this work and who's really gonna hold them to a standard when without them, the museum doesn't really have a gallery. It's like, it, it becomes this weird, you have to up with the whole thing kind of thing. It's a, a difficult question. Yeah. Oh, we have four minutes left for this reading. I feel like this actually goes back to like what Alberto was saying earlier, even about how the current systems that we have in place just don't work. And the only way to actually do things properly is to almost like start from scratch in ideal form. Um, someone also wrote in the comments about reimagining harmful spaces so that they're accessible and enjoyable for everyone. Um, I don't know, has anyone actually seen an example of that? Like, a space that was more self-aware and um, was also accessible. Because even I've been to the Met many times growing up, but I don't think I've ever seen, or maybe I've just passed through the primitive art exhibits. I can only think of harmful exhibits. I'm like trying to think of <laughs> that are good. <laughs> like now I'm just thinking about the Museum of Natural History and like the lens that they use of white supremacy to kind of also create this really othered perspective. I think an example of like an enjoyable experience that I had is I'm currently, I'm located in Nevada and it's Washoe and, and Paiute land. And there's a reservation not too far from where I live. Um, and they have a natural history museum. And so I think understanding my experience there and going visiting that museum and learning about the artifacts, about the way of living and the way of life from actual Paiute people, I think is, it's the most appropriate way <laughs> of doing so. So I think that's a little clear example that I can give. There's another comment saying the the bomb museum. I don't know what that it is, but I'm Googling it. <laughs> oh, the ball. It's um it says the, the ball exhibit at Yale. Oh, autocorrect. Okay. Okay. Well, it's good if that was a. <laughs> there's there's like a good example of where this is done appropriately. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll be able to check that out at some point. Um. Does anybody have any? final uh, comments or thoughts or anything um, before we move on to the next reading, which I think um, just being meaningful of timing. Okay, Nikki, maybe we should move on. Uh, okay, so the next and the final reading is Art, Art Museum's Racist by Maurice Berger. Uh, and before I give a quick summary, I want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, his great career as somebody who was really um, revolutionary and radical for his time. And I think even today. He unfortunately passed away uh, this past March from COVID-19 complications. So I hope we can have a fruitful discussion today to honor his work, thoughts, and career. Uh, and to give a summary of his work and, oh, this article, by the way, was published in 2004. 
Um, and he begins by discussing this new museum exhibition that he went to that demonstrates how curators and institutions display what they think illustrate urgent situations, but they don't actually discuss the situation of racism in the US. And um, at the time of writing, there were prominent artists of color, but uh, they were not at the status of white artists who have sort of reached the star status. So there was this problem of inclusion, but not equality. Uh, and he talks about how institutions almost always cater to white patrons and clientele because they sort of have that monetary control over these institutions. And so they also have control over the narratives and the operations at these museums. Um, and there is existing institutions dedicated to art by people of color, but he questions, is this segregation helpful or hurtful? And is it necessary that these institutions sort of exist? Um, and he also talks about the logical, logistical problem of, of accreditation because museums are institutions that need major funding from governments and different organizations, but this funding is not even possible without being accredited, without the accreditation but the standards for being uh, for accreditations are sort of built based off of white institutions. So there has to be like separate standards that are made so that this process is made possible for these separate institutions catering to artists of color. Uh, and he talks about how our history gets relegated to people of European descent. So even discussing or like ways of looking are sort of dominated by uh, a, just one race. And he taught, there's also an example given on an exhibition on Harlem that was organized by a white art historian. And he points to how Harlem is pictorialized and the visuality of Harlem is commodified, but the community in Harlem is actually not included or invited into this conversation. So it's sort of like pointing at Harlem and getting people to look at it and using it as entertainment, but not really um, including it as a meaningful part of discussion about culture or race. Um, yeah, so that's like the big summary of this article that like has so many really good and pointed examples of like continued poor representation of artists of color in major exhibitions in the US. I love this article so much. Uh, I'm sort of curious who read the, read the article, Are Art Museums Racist? Did anyone read it? But if if you did read it, um, do you have any thoughts? Points you agreed with, disagreed with? There was one quote that really stood out to me that I sort of want, wanted people's opinion on. Which, so he sort of, he actually just explicitly says what this article is about. At one point in the beginning, he says, my point in this article then is to examine the complex institutional conditions that result in the exclusion or misrepresentation of major cultural voices in the United States. So I want to know if um, anyone who read the article thought that he actually provides suggestions for solutions to include and represent these major black cultural voices in the US. Or if you have any thoughts on possibilities and solutions to actually include major black cultural voices in US institutions and exhibitions.
Um, I kind of think it's like the same thing as what we were maybe saying a little bit before, um, with just kind of including people at like diversity in the curatorial level, because I think that's kind of like the main way for that representation to like be seen. Because I guess the curator is is a person who can I think what goes on the show. So if that means in terms of like representation, I think that's probably one of the biggest changes. Yeah, he he talks about how so many of the curatorial positions, leadership positions, are all white people, uh, and they rarely hire people who actually get to have any influence over cultural policy. So, including artists of color is almost like not it's it's far from enough if leadership and curatorial positions continue to be dominated by white people only which is frustrating because this was written in 2004 and if someone were to tell me that this was written in 2020 i would be like oh yeah but i i would actually go even further to say like i um i personally worked at a black gallery uh makata and Brooklyn, and their whole thing is like museum of contemporary African master art. And I would still get like there's some exhibitions and stuff. Obviously, you know, most of the people that work there are everything are black, but people would still come up after and be like, you know, like they didn't get this master to it or like they and it was like I, I think it was it, it's like number one, yes, like you have to have black curators in the room, but then like on top of that you have to go almost above and beyond to kind of make sure the actual community like gets what's going on and feels connected to because I think we present things without thinking about it in a really like white centric way just because that's like the way that you know things have always been done. So uh, I think that that just goes back to curation again though. So like how you get say things. Um, thank you. Good to see your face, by the way. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I'm amused that there hasn't been much progress in hiring a more diverse curatorial and leadership staff. And I think an earlier part of this article sort of really stood out to me, especially in connection with the background of Maurice Berger. Um, so he quotes Malcolm X in the beginning. Um, this is in the first paragraph, last sentence. There is nothing that the white man will do to bring about true, sincere citizenship or civil rights recognition for black people in this country. They will always talk, but they won't practice it. And I sort of see this as like the answer for why there hasn't been much progress in actually hiring um, a diverse staff in curatorial positions and leadership positions. And this quote in particular sort of gave me chills thinking about how Maurice explicitly uh, talks about his background as somebody who is white but grew up in a predominantly black and Hispanic low income housing project, which like positions him in this um, marginalized position of like the working class who sort of quote unquote gets it. So I want to know if there are any thoughts on that or like thoughts on his credibility because he is this like white male art historian who got his PhD in art history from CUNY grad school, which is like a world renowned um, academic program. So he's somebody who like did well in a very institutional and traditional structure and path. So do you feel like there's, it's, it's weird to be reading something from him or is it great that somebody who you know presents as a, like an institutional white male is actually shedding light on all these problems i don't want to discredit him because he's white but there's definitely a privilege um in a way he's navigated his life because of his whiteness even though he does come from 
a lower class structure and I have to like show solidarity not only with like racially but also within class because I think you have to build um, both of those structures together to make change. Um, but I, it's always difficult reading the work of like white males critiquing black and brown artwork or exhibitions. Um, and that's just like my own opinion. It's always difficult to read their thoughts. And, but not to discredit him, you know, because I know that his class struggle had a lot to do with his upbringing, but also like white, um, like access to resources are more plentiful if you're white. I would, I would want to also ask you then, do you think there's something you say about like, if people listen to white people, it's important for them to like, I don't know, give that viewpoint or is it still kind of just like talking about it? And that's, I guess that's what I'm still trying to process, you know, I'm not like, I'm like, I'm not, I like, I like, I appreciate his opinion. He's done prolific and important work. Um, but I also think about like other artists or other writers who already have been doing their work, but haven't been highlighted in the way that Maurice has. Yeah, so. I mean, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. So I think about that sometimes too. And I hate that I'm, I don't want to speak ill of him because he's passed, but I hope that doesn't, I hope it's not sounding off that I'm, I'm like bashing on him. I think he's brilliant, but I think it's, I'm trying to critique the overall system, which all of us are trying to like navigate. I also do think he understands whiteness and white privilege really well, even just in the way he titled the article, because this article really could have been or even should have been titled art museums are racist period not are art museums racist question mark because he clearly thinks art museums are racist but i think i mean i i'm sort of like stretching my imagination here but i almost feel like he's poking fun at the fact that for so many privileged white people the fact that art museums are racist is like a surprise so he's sort of like in my mind, I'm reading reading the had the article title as like, are art museums racist? Oh my god, I had no idea. Like, for so many people, like I actually read, uh, I, I I should get the link to this study, but um, there was a survey done, and the qu big question from the survey was, do you think these institutions are ethical? And it was different categories like natural history museums, history museums. So, like, and it had like a bunch of categories of museums and art museums ranked highest in terms of how ethical they are seen by the public, which just, that's laughable. Um, so yeah, I thought this title was really interesting as well. Um, my final question we have six minutes left for this reading, but my final question is, in what way does this article feel relevant to this time? Uh, and in what ways does this article feel outdated? Um, I just wanted to make a point about um, uh, the previous question uh, a bit and also answer this one. Um, there's something, like you said, the title itself is very to, it's that like it has uh, it was written with the intent I'm assuming to sort of like um, poke at that like issue of like the the fact that it's formatted as a question and um, I think maybe today like what I'm sort of feeling is that I don't know but at the same time like a title needs to attract readers and sort of um, you know draw people in and 
I guess to me that's like a, a, a way like as a writer you would um, put a question in as a title but like today I think um, we kind of have to move past of like asking is this racist is that racist uh, you know and just uh, talking about like I don't know like it, it is racist as a fact and it, and like demystifying or like sort of demonstrating to white people, mostly white people who don't understand that like, if your whole system is built upon like exclusion and exploitation, it is racist. It's like, if you, a white person, a curator or, you know, someone in management thinks, if you think you're not racist, like that's not what makes the museum not racist. Um, so I think like uh, talking about like, obviously, and there's been more talk about like systemic um, issues and how these institutions are sort of structured. And I, I think that's a little bit more um, what we're talking about uh, like to, right now. So in that way, it sort of feels outdated, but um, yeah, I, I actually haven't read it. So I, maybe after reading it, I'd change my mind. So. <laughs> So I'm right now a PhD student and I'm thinking about how there are so many, like this was written in the 90s, but if I think about like what, what black people right now are like in curatorial roles at major art institutions and it's people who are able to thrive in like, who were somehow able to thrive in like white supremacists educational systems to get to that point. And so there's still this selecting of like, it can't, it can't really be a black museum that's still within this set of like how we accredit it, how we do accreditation and all of these things. It still is not going to be free of anti-blackness if it's not, if it's, not like accessible to people who aren't you know graduates of CUNY or whatever thank you for correcting me it's not written in 2004 I was corrected yesterday during a prep meeting and I still got it wrong I'm sorry it was written in 1990 right yes 1990 um Yeah, I to respond to um, Victoria as well as Jasmine. I think the title "Are Art Museums Racist?" That yeah, it's like redundant today. We all know art museums are racist now, and it's difficult to think about ways to go past that. Yeah. And I was frustrated with this reading at points because I sort of wanted him to give us explicit solutions, but that was hard to find other than hiring more um, people of color in curatorial positions and leadership roles. But then like earlier in the meeting, um, someone brought up, I feel like it was Claire, was there a Claire? Clay, no, Clay brought up that uh, like what do boards do so even if there are creators and lead, like executives of color if the board is almost entirely white what does that mean who still controls the narrative so I think these are all questions that are on our minds that makes museums really difficult to maintain as anti-blackness is pervasive in these institutions that are supposed to be housing culture and oftentimes what they claim is official culture, which is actually very exclusive and narrow in definition. Um, that's actually time for this reading and we wanted to take the next 
uh, 20 minutes or so to sort of talk about all the readings together and any thoughts that we missed, um, any anti-museum or pro-museum thoughts. Also, we could make this a time to talk about how there's this, I think, an ongoing campaign to use October as a month to boycott museums. How do we feel about that? Is that useful? Is it useless? Is it weird? Is it really great? Is it clever? What does this mean culturally, economically? Why are we doing this? All the things, all the things. Um, I think that, you know, the source of the boycott has been somewhat successful for sure. Um, but I guess the, the thing that I always wonder about with something like this, like, for example, boycotting the museum for like a month, would be like how to make sure it happens in, in a way that actually affects them. Because I remember, like, I don't know what you did, I remember, like, the HM thing when we boycotted them and then they just did like a 10% off sale and everyone came back. So it's like one of those things where I wonder how, how to make that something that's like long lasting and like people really get behind. And I guess that's the only sort of way to do it. But we're talking serious and it's for sure. Yeah, I think that the thing and yeah, I like worry about the boycott thing because it is very much in line with the anti-museum sentiments and actions, but I worry about who it's going to hurt and um, layoffs that might be taking place because of boycotts in theory. I don't know if like people who were planning on going to museums even really care about protecting front of house staff. Uh, and in terms of the broader conversations about being anti-museums, to even like reach out further into like other institutions or systems that a lot of people in today's society sort of counter and are becoming outdated. I think it might be useful to think about those as well, to think about parallels. And the only thing that came to mind was like marriage because there's a lot of problematic parts of that social system and people don't necessarily boycott it people just i think of many groups of people have a sort of lost interest in it because it's so problematic and exclusive and illegal for some people many people um and i wonder if like museums just continue doing things the way they have been doing it will people lose interest and stop going to museums naturally over time yeah these are these are just some of the thoughts that i've had i'm rambling sorry <laughs> um about the boycotting museums for october which is it's actually um quite interesting that um you mentioned that because uh, uh museums here are actually closed for october because of covid there's been like a another wave that um and it's caused like all um art institutions in general to be closed for this month um and i i think it's interesting to think about like what that means when you know um an institution is closed but like there's still like room for reflection and to sort of um think about what can be changed like as a museum but Again, like the fact that it's closed for because of COVID, maybe doesn't uh, prompt that kind of uh, discussion. And um, thinking in parallel of other institutions, um, yeah, I think like even like when I'm thinking about, first of all, with the the inclusion of people of color, I think one of the biggest culprits that I'm not sure if people think about as much or like I just know from my experience like the one, one of the hardest one of the biggest barriers I think is the sort of the the hiring process and the sort of like the the inclusion of said black person in uh, uh, predominantly white um, staff and how like 
personally in my experience like uh, now like it's difficult to the point where like there's even a, a cycle that's been sort of shown in studies where it's like the black person goes in and then goes through the same typical um sort of uh, issues and that aren't addressed correctly and sort of ends up quitting or you know finding a way out and it just like it repeats and repeats and because of that like that's that makes in turn that makes that um uh, people of color cannot obtain like those um higher up positions and things won't change so again it's like the whole uh, the framing of the, the hiring process and how it's sort of um the the environment itself it, it's not um like it's not healthy it's not you know nourishing or or uh like it, it can't be long term even if you you feel or if i feel in my experience like um yeah i i got hired and uh i'm part of this team now or whatever this uh um institution but at the same time like with all everything you face it's like it's not worth it like personally sometimes for me and i just want to leave and i think that is a big problem and um again with the the boards like that's another thing that i'm glad it was uh, mentioned because so again another thing that because the board members are rarely ever seen or you know um they're only listed on the website or whatever of the institution or the art gallery and so it's hard to actually see like who composes it and it is 99 percent like usually white people and um they are the ones that make the, the decisions again the donors make the decisions again if they are all pe white people like again if they're like if in their if they're in the background and they're still like orchestrating all of this even if there are black or indigenous or people of color employees like nothing will change again so that's like sort of my frustration with it all um yeah i i want to actually also add to just like what you were saying about the frustration of just like if being hired as a person of color that that was um the point addressed in the the first reading that um the authors said that, that there should be a rule of three when it comes to each um, department in the museum. So there shouldn't just be one or two people of color, like being the representatives in each department, there should be at least three. And that would create like a more substantial platform for their voices to be heard. Um, I don't know if you would agree that would be like implemented properly or like also a possible solution, but I just thought it was also an interesting point. Um, I want to bring this up also. I, I do, I will say, I do think the Guggenheim is extremely problematic as a museum, but just as an example of a, a diversity, equity, access, and inclusion plan, they have a, a two-year, like, bullet point, like, tables, like, plan to, that they have, like, deadlines they plan to enact all of these things. So it just, as, an interesting thing to that some museums are doing. Um, they're one of the major institutions to actually have laid this out. So, thinking about uh, like the idea of a boycott, which I'm, I don't know, I'm not very well read in like the history of, of these kinds of actions, but I just don't know if they can even be as powerful like in 2020, um, especially not when so much of, of like, like, we're just not leaving the house. Like I would never even think to go to a museum anytime soon. Um, but there's also like the way museums are set up, like it's against like the rules to do things like sell artwork to pay your employees or things like that, that could like it, you, you'll lose your accreditation if you do that. And like, if you, if we could like somehow, if museums like got their like act together and just sort of mass moved away from that model 
I think like that would be something that actually materially benefited their like low ranking employees who were mostly people of color. And it's something that would keep, because I know that, you know, a lot of people start out like, like working the front desk and museums and stuff with the hopes of moving up through the ranks. But like, if you can't support yourself in that job, you'll never, you'll never make it to curatorial because you have to go get a different job. Like you can't, you have to, you have to leave that, that situation. So there's never even the chance because there's so much money, but it's just not going to the actual people running, running the day-to-day -day operations. Yeah, I can actually say from experience that that is definitely what's like the case. I was um, working as a guest assistant at MoMA right after the Rona like happened. And it's like one of those things where definitely just seeing the behind the scenes and like being back there, you can tell that the amount of people that they would like lay off just randomly and things like that, and not just moments, but like all, you know, all museums, it, it goes to show like the priorities are obviously like maintaining assets rather than, you know, lower level staff. So I, I don't know what would change that priority. I think maybe social pressure is the only thing I can I kind of think of right now, but. I don't, I don't know what would make them choose the ethical route. Personally, I've been trying to call people out and not anonymously. And I, I can share this because actually it's public information, so whatever. But I was most recently at the Brooklyn Museum as an employee. And um, also to go back to the point about the accessioning the collection to raise funds to actually keep employees. Right, they don't do that. Um, the Brooklyn Museum laid off like more than 30 or 40 people. And then uh, only several weeks after that started the accessioning the collection, but only to raise funds for museum operations because they don't care about their employees. And also the accessioning is usually you know, strongly discouraged because it demotivates future donors of objects to give to the museum because there that increases the chance of their object just being sold later which again holds up white supremacy and i thought maybe like a solution to making museums care more about ethics or like actually implement um cultural policy that upholds ethics of diversity I thought maybe it would help to get rid of the person who reinforces racism and racist culture at an institution. And the director of the museum, um, at, at the Brooklyn Museum, Ann Pasternak, was, I mean, she was, ex she was and still is explicitly racist. So I called her out at an all staff meeting and then I got laid off for COVID reasons. And then I talked to hyper allergic about it. So I've been trying to get her to step the fuck down. <laughs> I'm sorry. Because um, maybe if getting rid of a leader, like maybe getting rid of a, that leader helps, but I don't know. Um, and I've also been just reading a lot of things from Change the Museum, um, which is like the new Instagram page that posts all the anonymous experiences of racism at museums and they're heartbreaking. And it's also heartbreaking that they have to be anonymous or feel like they have to be anonymous. And I think it, would, it, would, it just really helps to have more names and faces that are willing to speak up. I mean, it's terrifying, it's a huge career risk, but yeah. I'm, at a, I'm personally at a place where I don't know what the solutions are, but I just have to experiment with different tactics. Oh, wow, sorry, I talked for so long. <laughs> we have five minutes left and we also want to ask for any feedback. Um, I don't know if this was already mentioned, but this was our first time trying out the book club as a collaboration between April and Amafas. Really grateful you all made time on a Sunday afternoon. Um, this could be a series if people want that. It, it also, like, we designed this as a one-off thing, but if people want to do this in the future, we could turn it into a series, potentially, that happens once a month or whatever um, frequency is desired or reasonable. 
um, yeah, so let us know if you would like for this to happen in the future, um, if you didn't like the readings, if you love the readings, if you want us to pull resources from different things, if you want the resources to actually not just be texts, but also videos or audio. Yeah, please give us any feedback at all. Um, I just have a quick question. Was there um, a past book club meeting? Um, and if so, like, would I be able to access the readings? No, okay, no. Is this the first one? Okay. Um, And then Victoria, I'm, I'm not sure if you got the initial readings. If not, you can share your email with us privately, either Blakey or myself, and we'll make sure to resend you that email with the readings that we discussed today. Okay, thank you. I think I already received them, so okay. I'll dig in later.